accountability and um, and racial justice at Ohio State, pilot uh, to year four. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Amanda Postal and Alexis Duffy. Amanda is a project manager with Ohio State's Affordable Learning Exchange, and she works closely with faculty across all campuses to manage their grant projects and zero dollar course transformations and racial justice. Amanda also manages the Ohio Open Ed Collaborative Project, which brings together faculty from across Ohio to curate no cost course materials for shared high enrollment courses. Alexis Duffy is the Affordable Outreach and Education Consultant with Ohio State's Affordable Learning Exchange. She holds degrees from Michigan State University, Emerson College, and The Ohio State University. With a background in educational publishing, Alexis works closely with faculty and administrators as they implement affordable solutions. Alexis also teaches a general education seminar to Ohio State students. So welcome Amanda and Alexis, and um, you can go ahead and share your screen and uh, we can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, it was really nice to hear that Anna was introducing us today. We've actually worked together for the last five years on that Ohio Open Ed Collaborative Project. So she's been one of uh, the rock star faculty who helped me with a lot of that work. So that was really, really nice to, to get to see you again today, Anna. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get my slides pulled up here. Okay, here we go. This part always makes me nervous. Okay. <laughs> Let me get this started here. Can't see my slides. Okay, so thank you again um, to Anna. I will um, go ahead and just kind of get us started here. So I'm not going to read the learning objectives here uh, word for word, um, but what we're hoping that you can all walk away with today is just kind of a general understanding of the work that we've done with racial justice um, as part of our affordability work here at Ohio State as well as ways that you can support your faculty through this work. Um, we also want you to be able to discover some resources that are available, uh, not just those that we've worked on, um, but those that have been um, put together by some of our colleagues across the country as well. So before I get too much into the racial justice grant program, I wanted to talk a little bit about the affordable learning exchange and the work that we did that kind of led up to this project. So for um, our work, we've been doing uh, savings work at Ohio State since 2016, and we've saved students about $21 million through these faculty grant projects that we've been doing. So this can range anywhere from helping faculty adopt an existing open textbook to um, writing their own book, a combination of the two. It can be a lending library for an art course. It can look like a lot of different things. We also have an inclusive access program. Um, and with that combined savings, we're at $44 million um, since 2016. Um, between Alexis and I, as well as Amanda Larson and other project managers, we've completed 164 faculty projects across 50 departments, schools, and colleges. Um, with 200,000 students impacted at all Ohio State campuses. So a pretty big uh, swath there of um, departments. We've been able to affect a lot of change, I'm so sorry, across the um, university as well. So when it came time um, in 2020, Ashley and <clears throat> our team, excuse me, had... Um, really thought about the events that had taken place that summer and wanted to do something that could affect some change at Ohio State. We weren't really sure where to start or what to do. Um, Ashley approached a lot of faculty that we had worked with in the past, as well as leaders within um, our learning technologies department, and kind of went to them and said, what can we do to bring the faculty together? Uh, Ashley Miller is our former director of the Affordable Learning Exchange team. Um, she actually left us for another really excellent opportunity um, with uh, the state of Ohio 
uh, back in the early spring. But I wanted to pull this quote out from her um, from an article that was done for the Lantern on our affordable learning exchange racial justice grants, because it really encompasses how we got to this point and how we were able to expand our scope into the racial justice grant program. So all of that work um, that Ashley did then went into this racial justice grant pilot group. So we approached the leadership with this idea in June of 2020. So pretty quickly after all of um, those events had taken place, we knew we had a little bit of funding that we could um, move around to uh, give the faculty some incentives to do this work. We wanted to ask them to transform one course um, or a series of courses by adding racial justice elements to the syllabus or their assignments. Uh, we put out a call for proposals that only went to former grant winners because we knew that um, they would be the ones most eager to get started on this project. And so from that initial pool, we selected nine faculty projects. Um, they were from a variety of departments, as you can see here, anywhere from design to biology to educational studies. Um, we impacted a little over 3,500 students with that initial pilot. Each of the grant winners received $500, um, which they could use um, for a stipend towards their salary. They could use it to purchase materials that they would utilize in the course, which I'll talk a little bit about how um, some folks did that later on. Um, we also provided them with project management support. Um, myself and Alexis, as well as Amanda Larson, um, who works on our team, provided that support to them with check-ins. Um, there was no additional savings that was required for these projects. So all of our projects require that um, their student savings involved. We just asked that all the materials that they use be at no additional cost to students. So we were again looking at open and library materials for these projects. And we also surveyed all of the faculty participants at the beginning and the end of the cohort. Uh, Ashley brought them together in a focus group at the end and kind of gathered their ideas of how we could improve the program um, once we got things going. So in 2021, we added those racial justice grants to our ALX grant offerings, which are in um, $0 course transformations or syllabus review, where we're asking them to reduce the um, cost for their course by 25%. So since those have been added, we've completed 44 faculty projects. That includes the cohort that's working right now on their projects, and those will be ready for the autumn 23 semester. We've impacted 26 departments and colleges, um, and this reach extends beyond just the Columbus campus for Ohio State. We've done projects at uh, multiple projects, I believe, at Lima, Mansfield, and the Newark campuses. Um, and racial justice grants can also be given in combination with those other grants. So a lot of times we have faculty who are also uh, getting rid of their textbook costs and implementing these into their course or maybe they've already gotten rid of their textbook and they wanna come back to us and implement more of the racial justice curriculum into their course. So for the project management of these teams, we did a kickoff meeting with everyone. Um, for that initial pilot cohort, it looked a little bit different because they didn't start at the same time as all of our other grant winners. Um, once we implemented this into the rest of our grant program. We had them all in a kickoff meeting together. From there, we work with the faculty to co-author what we call a scope of work that just kind of outlines the project, what they're going to do, what kind of support they need, what might fall outside of the scope, and then put together a project plan with them as well that's more of a timeline that breaks down those tasks into smaller pieces. For the pilot cohort, we tried just doing monthly email check-ins and we found that that just didn't really work too well. It was a little too informal and we weren't really getting um, updates from them. It was just kind of one of those things it was like, eh, yeah, maybe I'll get back to that. But we never really heard a lot from the faculty. Um, so we moved them to monthly Zoom or phone check in calls with a rolling meeting agenda so that each time we met, we had something um, to talk about. And the faculty always tell us that these check-in calls really hold them accountable to their project goals. And it's just an opportunity for them to um, talk to us as well if they've run into any problems um, since the last time that we checked in. Um, and that project support also includes connecting them with libraries 
instructional design consultations, if they need support with video or creating video, captioning, accessibility, we can connect them uh, with all of those folks on campus. Um, I always like how Alexis refers to it as being a concierge at Ohio State because it makes it sound like we're really fancy to me. So that's <laughs> kind of the way that I like to refer to that. Um, and we also offered support for any conversations that they had with their department leadership um, and just were there kind of as a sounding board for them if they had pushback from students as well. So I'm going to go ahead and pass um, things over to Alexis to talk a little bit about um, some more of that project management support. Thanks, Amanda. Yes, I do like things that are fancy. So of course I would brand it a concierge service. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our project management services as Amanda mentioned, but I'm also gonna talk about how that changed um, over the years. So she talked a lot about the project management process just in general. So we started with kickoff and scope of work, and then we figured out a project plan that we would start working on with them together. And throughout that process, we would look for opportunities as a, con a good concierge might to connect them with our partners, with consultations, with tech support, instructional design. These are all partnerships and relationships that we offer to our grant winners. So in an effort to collect all of those different opportunities for support and to standardize those offerings, we decided to put them into our own Canvas course that we could offer to a cohort that we would progress through over the course of the project as a cohort together and lead them into these different topics as we went along. So the topics you see here, uh, so right now we're in our second iteration of the course. The last year was our first cohort in the course, and now we're in our second. So the topics that you see here listed on the left, these are all typical offerings in terms of project management support that we offer. Um, and one really cool thing that we did was, this was sort of a, I mean, everything we do is collaborative, but the course itself was collaborative too, right? So we asked subject matter experts to participate in the authoring and creation of these modules as well. So um, of course we start with scope of work and project management. We talk about basic affordability, uh, definitions, landscape, that things like that. What's, what's, what is affordability to instructors that might be new to it? And then what are we doing here at Ohio State? What do those efforts look like? What are some basic resources that you might have? Uh, then we worked with our uh, copyright librarians to author a really, honestly, this one is my favorite module in the course because they developed this really cool um, like quiz where they ask the, uh, they ask the instructors to consider the Supreme Court cases, there was just a new decision this week, actually, Supreme Court cases in fair use and sort of predict how they ruled before they read the answer. And I just thought that was a really good use of the course and a good way to engage uh, people on the topic of fair use and copyright. So that's one. We talk about open pedagogy in the classroom. That was authored by Amanda Larson, who is part of our partnership with the libraries. She is the affordable learning instructional consultant with the libraries. She is such a wonderful resource. She put this together, uh, talking about open pedagogy, how they can do that, how they can develop their course in a way to utilize open pedagogy. Uh, Pressbooks user training. We see a lot of Pressbooks textbook creation. Um, it's really an excellent tool. Mike Shiflett was our, or I think he's, I think that's still part of his job title, uh, the publishing coordinator. Amanda Larson also works on that as well. So he put together a great module on like getting into Pressbooks, basics, you know, how to, how to set up a book, organization, adding media, things like that. A um, little bit about H5P. He did all that and he put that into the um, canvas. I mean, it's a really good primer, but of course we are, as a team, ALX is still available to all of our grant winners as they progress through. So that's sort of like a reference, but we are all still available as a need on an as needed basis to support them as well. Uh, we did accessibility and content creation. This sort of goes with um, the essential Carmen course setup at the very bottom. We partnered with our instructional design, our course design folks who focus on online education. They sort of gave us, um, particularly in the essential Carmen course setup, the sort of this, don't get me wrong, the bare minimum that we ask instructors to do to make sure that students are having a consistent and successful uh, experience in Canvas, right? So they had sort of a checklist. These are the things we must do. And then we also talk about accessibility and content creation so that when they're creating new elements that they're going to use in the classroom, we are thinking about accessibility from the ground up 
rather than trying to go back and doubling our efforts to try to make edits to something that was already built and that can, as we all know, can be very difficult. Of course, we have an anti-racism in course design module, which I'll talk to you in detail about in just a second. Um, and I have a background in educational publishing and I worked with uh, instructors who were writing textbooks. So I use some of that former expertise to develop some materials to help instructors that are maybe new to writing a textbook to think about like holistically what a textbook looks like, table of content, um, the writing process, the writing schedule, um, art, uh, research, and then citations, permissions. That's always lots of fun. And it's much better, just like accessibility, it's much better if you think about it from the beginning than if you have to go back and double back over your efforts. So the first time we ran the course, we, we sort of, we closed the whole course and we released a module by module. And that the goal of that the goal of that was to 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 create a engaging community we had hoped that the cohort would talk to each other a lot about the things that they were reading all at the same time right they were all together they were all reading about copyright the same week what are your feelings i don't know what are your feelings about copyright you can see why perhaps we didn't quite get the engagement we'd hoped and a lot of that too is we're walking that fine line between um offering a, a space to collaborate to instructors, but we all know that instructors have a lot to do and they have a lot of responsibilities and a lot of work. So we also don't want to, you know, give them just more work to do, but we do want to offer all this and give them a space to work together. So we, it turns out that the other thing about releasing them week by week was that um, perhaps somebody was way ahead in their project plan and they, needed the press books module say way before we got there well we wanted to release all that content right at the beginning so they could go where they needed to go when they needed to go there rather than us you know offering a little bit by little bit just to just to try to make them respond to my discussion question in <laughs> Kansas all right Amanda you can go on to the next slide thank you all right so in terms of the module on open for anti-racism so based on the success of that racial justice grant offering that Amanda talked to you about in depth, uh, we wanted to be able to standardize that information and provide that information to all of our grant winners as well, regardless of whether or not they had won that racial justice grant. We decided that it was really an important part, especially for instructors that are in the redesign or the design phases of a course to consider those types of topics. So as you, I'm sure you, if you don't know her already, she's very friendly, Amanda here. Um, I'm sure you got the sense that she's very friendly and happy to connect. At Open Ed in 2021, Amanda connected with uh, with Joy Shoemate from College of the Canyons. Uh, during their session, her and Joyce and her colleagues from College of the Canyons presented on this course, um, Open for Anti-Racism. The, the course, of course, since it was course, of course, I did that in practice too, and I laughed at myself, so I'll laugh now. Um, the course is open, of course, and so we were able to borrow it and they authored it in Canvas Commons and we were just able to pull that over, import that into our course from Canvas Commons. So we did, we added that into the, into our course. We had to do a little bit of a revision because there was some, you know, specific to their community. So we had to just do a little bit of revision, but it was a very, it was a very light lift, you know, it was just a matter of taking some things out. It was a matter of updating some formatting, making sure that it matched our style guide. And we were really happy to see some familiar faces. Uh, there's the video in the course already without us intervening, featuring Jasmine Roberts Cruz, who actually was a member of both of ALX's inaugural cohorts, which is the inaugural cohort period back in 2016, and then also the inaugural cohort of the racial justice grant. So we were really excited to see her. She's great. She does a lot of work in this area. So um, the course, it's, it's, a, it's very much an introduction. So it starts by talking generally. So how do instructors, how do we define anti-racism? What, what makes talking about race difficult? There's then a moment in the course where we define, we take a moment to just define key terms. We do some level setting. We make sure everybody has the same vocabulary with which to communicate. Uh, then participants read about how to be anti-racist generally. That's in life, work, in public, when they're engaging in the larger world and in culture. And then finally, the course talks about how to do that work inside of a course using intentional design, how to consider assignments, how to consider creating an inclusive environment, 
Reading lists, of course, are a very easy place to start. Um, and that's just one piece. And there's a lot more you can do. I personally learned so much from this course about intentional course design um, for anti-racism. And it's a lot more nuanced than I was expecting. And they, they put together a great course. Oops, okay. So um, yes, we're lucky also at Ohio State to have, uh, I'm, as I mentioned before, Amanda Larson, who also helps us take these things a little bit farther and offers us new resources uh, that we're not always aware of. And so of course we set up consultations when instructors wanna engage with these topics further. Okay. And I just wanna mention um, yeah. before we move on Alexis that I've kept in touch with Joy. We've submitted to present together actually at the open ed conference um about me just like literally cold emailing her and asking her if we could talk a little bit more about her session um and the course itself i know that they are also in the um, process of editing the course and possibly expanding it out into more weeks so tbd on that i know that they piloted it with their faculty at college of the canyons um, but I would definitely keep uh, your ears and eyes open at Open Ed or just um, on the OFAR website. Um, if you just Google Open for Anti-Racism and College of the Canyons, there are several places where you can access the course materials. The link I have here in the slides, um, and I put a link to a um, Google Slides version of this as well, um, will take you to the self-paced Open for Anti-Racism course that you can download from the Canvas Commons like Alexis was talking about. Um, there's other versions of it out there in OER Commons, so there's a whole lot of places um, that you can find this content, and they're always actively working on updating it, too. Yep, it, I mean, it looks like they're posting some links in the chat for us, too, for to send them awesome. to the course, too, which is fabulous. Great. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I guess we are back to me now. Um, I just wanted to pull a couple of examples out um, I know we've done about 40 projects. These are two that I personally managed. Um, Don, who's the second one I'm going to talk about, was in our uh, pilot cohort. Um, Hazal was one of the faculty that I worked with who actually used her money to buy a physical item. Um, and she used some of her funds to buy physical copies of that designer's critical alphabet. Um, if someone's able to put the link to that in the chat, that would be excellent. Um, they're sold on Etsy and it's a very beautifully drawn alphabet um, that is a deck of cards that helps introduce the students to critical theory concepts and gives them something to reflect on during the design process. So she really kind of took it to a different level where there's also an online free version of this that's used in the course, but she also got physical copies of this because this is an art and design course. Um, and that's something that they can actually have in the classroom. Um, the project that Don worked on in our astronomy department was a little bit different. Um, it was looking at statistics with minority enrollment in STEM courses. Um, not just at Ohio State, but nationally um, within those fields and kind of looking at those different um, statistics and how they affect uh, student outcomes. So two very different projects and two different departments. Um, and what I really found interesting when we got started with this was the faculty came to us with ideas for things to do that we had not even thought of. They were already thinking about this before we even got this project started. Um, and really came to us with great ideas, um, and they were willing to share those with each other as well, which was really great. Another really big piece of our grant program and this racial justice grant program is feedback and storytelling. Uh, we've been very fortunate as the ALX team to have a dedicated marketing and communications person who works with our team. Uh, Randy is amazing. I can't say enough about the work that she's done for our team, writing up all of these stories on the projects, uh, managing student employees to help with a lot of that work as well. I just wanted to pull a few um, quotes out. There's links to all of these stories. Some were written um, by our marketing team. The last one, um, for Missy Beers in particular was written by the arts and sciences department, but they're all OSU um, resources. Just a really nice way to talk about how all of these different faculty worked on their projects. Um, we also meet with our marketing folks a couple times a month, if not just one time a month, um, to kind of talk to them about 
projects that we think would be good to review? What would be a good person to interview? What's an interesting project um, that we've been working on? And then these oftentimes get published in the newsletters that go out um, to our faculty, staff, and students. They get put in the Lantern, which is our um, student publication. So it's just a really nice way to showcase the work that faculty are doing. Um, and it, it puts their name out there too and gives them an opportunity to talk about their project work. Okay, that's, that's me again, lucky you. So um, in terms of our future, so we've already started to see some more repercussions other than just people coming back because we've seen some previous grant winners that saw what the, uh, the first few cohorts of racial justice grant winners did and are wanting to come back to us to apply those concepts to their, their previous projects. So what our, um, one of the instructors, the coordinator actually for the first year English composition course, she won a traditional course redesign grant. So I worked with her over the course of one of our cohort years and she put together a huge master course with curated information so that other instructors that teach the course, because it's a very large course, so there's many instructors. So other people that could teach the course, they could import that course, make it their own, and then use that. It was all based on uh, open artifacts from the library. I know uh, the instructor partnered with Amanda Larson again, another hat tip to Amanda. Um, she partnered to, with her to learn about open pedagogy. Um, and so the course contains not only those artifacts from the library, but also um, a whole host of materials that are uh, related so that uh, there's reading materials and then artifacts themselves with which to discuss this, that the students can discuss. Um, so that course was very successful. And after a year of implementation, the instructor came back to us and she wanted to take her work further and add in this racial justice element. She saw that natural connection between open and racial justice topics and just wanted to keep going and layer that into her project as well. So now we're working again to find ways to support, in, to support instructors in these areas. It's actually very neat because what she's doing is creating this course that is really for other instructors. So a lot of this is instructor support based. So she's discussing creating a matrix or a heuristic to help push racial justice and open course design even further and to help instructors gauge where they are and find ways to take that work and expand it. It's a really, um, it's a really inspiring project and she's teaching me a lot. You know, I'm just trying to find ways to support her and to, to give her resources and she, I'm learning so much going along with her. Um, in terms of new opportunities for evolution, um, we are trying to think of building on the ways that we can build on our previous work in new ways. So there are lots of existing community of practices with instructors. Um, I'm a part of one and it is a really vibrant place for people to share their challenges and their successes and to share um, ideas and get feedback from other instructors. And it's really a wonderful place, at least the one I'm part of, and I know there are more on campus. Um, there are, it's a really wonderful place to, to do some professional development casually, sort of in a fun way with your, with your colleagues. So we are hoping to find more of these communities of practice, maybe create our own. We're just trying to find a way that we can really be effective so that instructors that are dealing with these racial justice topics in course design and figuring out how and sharing with each other on this theme. There's lots of different themes for these communities of practice. So we want to find the best way to connect other people on this theme. And then of course, it's always a good idea to, to keep track of that library of resources. We're so, there's there's a wealth of information, good information on the internet, some not so good, but you know, here in academia, I think we have a good, uh, a good sense for which is a good source and what isn't. And to keep track of those good sources, it's a really, uh, it's hard to do, but it's really, um, it can really pay off in the end. Okay, we can go on Amanda, thank you. So in terms of how can you incorporate this into your work? So I know Ohio State might be uniquely large, but I do have, get the feeling that we all at universities might feel a little bit siloed in our own department, our own groups, our own centers, wherever it is you work, you're surrounded by a core group of people. Hopefully you like them. You're surrounded by a core group of people and it can feel siloed. You can feel like you're just talking to the same people doing the same things again and again. It is worthwhile to take a moment to do a landscape review. Find out what type of work is already going on at the university or your college. I'm sure there is some, whether it's a student, student group, instructor group, 
IT group, instructional design, libraries, you know, there are administrators, there's lots of different audiences for these groups. Find out what's going on. Find ways that you can work across departments and across groups to collaborate on your like-minded issues. And we have actually learned so much from our course designers, from our instructional design team. They have been do at this for longer than we knew. And they already had, I mean, our instructional designers have an intense collection of documentation and it exists on these topics as well. So they are a wonderful resource. Perhaps you should check in with your instructor support and instructional design folks as well. And there are likely formal DEIJ groups around the university too that you might know of. And it's smart to check in with them and figure out what they're doing and how you might be able to contribute or how you might be able to expand their work in your area as well. So I can start us, I think Alexis and I were both gonna talk a little bit here. Um, as far as supporting your faculty through this work, I will say in my own personal experience managing these grants, I haven't really had a lot of feedback from faculty that there's been pushback from administration. What I've heard about is pushback from students. And it's often one student that just throws a wrench into a discussion or leaves a ridiculous comment on a evaluation at the end of the year that, you know, they're just trying to rub somebody the wrong way and ruffle feathers. Um, it's just nice for them to have somebody as a sounding board. Even if you can't give them all of the solutions, they just really sometimes want somebody to talk to um, that just kind of understands what they've uh, been going through through this process. And I think that really happens a lot through those regular check-ins check that we have with our faculty. Um, I know a lot of times I'll get on those calls and they have a little note of everything that they've thought about for the last month that they wanted to tell me the next time that we met. Or maybe they've already typed it into the Word doc that we have um, going with our rolling meeting notes. We also give them an opportunity to fill out a customer satisfaction survey, as we call it, um, at the end of each cohort, that gives them a place to provide us with feedback on how we can improve this process, how can we better support them, um, and what can we do to um, provide more resources maybe to them as well. I also, um, I mean, as evidenced by our course that we talked about in depth a little bit ago, um, I think it's really useful to standardize and document those support offerings. The course gave us a way to do that all in one place that we could send instructors to. And even if you don't send them to it, if you have a standardized, organized collection of what it is you do and how it is you do it, that's gonna help you um, easily share and easily facilitate discussions. And I, I have to remind myself of this all the time that I don't have to be the expert in any of these things. I just have to be ready to participate in the conversation, especially in this area. This is a this is a changing, this is a changing conversation. This is a changing time, and we can learn from each other. And I know that I have a lot to learn. I've learned a lot already in this area, and there's a long way to go. And that is great for me. And it's okay to participate in that conversation without certainly not the expert, but I, I, you know, we all, we're all learning. It's, it's good. So I'm highly impressed. We've left almost 15 minutes for good questions. Us. Look at us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to thank everybody again for coming to this session um, and for the planning committee for the opportunity that you gave us to talk about this today. I've put our emails in here. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. I know I'm always happy to talk to people. I'm like the blabber mouth, I guess, of the team. So <laughs> please feel free to email me or Alexis. Um, if we can't help you, we will connect you to somebody who probably can. And it might be Amanda Larson. Um, <laughs> it might be Mike. It might be somebody else's name that you heard us talk about today. Um, but I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that I can see the chat more easily again. Um, and we can go ahead and um, take any questions. Yeah. I'm seeing one from Cheryl about um, asking, does the Open for Anti-Racism course have a Creative Commons license? It does indeed. Um, and we gave credit as it prescribed. See, we have a hand raised. Hi, yes, I, I can't access my uh, 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 
chat, but I wanted to, my name is Adrienne Goslin. I'm at uh, Cleveland State. And I, I wanted to thank you for uh, including faculty support and feedback for faculty support and feedback for negative comments. Uh, that that often come from from students because sometimes that can be so demoralizing and the important thing is to know you, you know you we're we're not alone when when this happens that this is new um, and if that's something that more of us need to understand I I think it's a point worth worth mentioning so thank you yeah thank you yeah and I would say. I feel thankful that it's been kind of few and far between um, when that has happened, but I think the faculty really appreciate just having us there as somebody to talk to. That's a good question, April. April is asking, are you preparing for any changes in light of S State Bill 83? I am being an ostrich right now and putting my head in the sand. So not at this moment. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's happening right now too is our team itself is kind of in a big change mm -hmm. right now. Uh, how we work with faculty and the grants and kind of the work we've been doing since 2016 is going to dramatically change by the fall. So that's really going to have an effect on, you know, what we can do with that information from that, that Senate bill as well. It's always fun being in higher ed when there's tons and tons of change happening. <laughs> And I know with that course to being published out in California, like Alexis mentioned, there were some things that we pulled out that were more specific to that state. So that may be something that we'll need to think about in the future um, if we continue using that course is referencing to some of that as well. Um, Amanda, we're getting a question. Have you worked with a course outside of the humanities that you can give an example of? What impact did that work have? Did your work? We did um, that astronomy course that I talked about with Don Turndrup. I'm also working on two, um, actually three uh, math courses in this term. Mm -hmm. Two are in accounting, uh, okay. tax law and accounting, and another is um, more of a statistics course. So those are still kind of in development and aren't quite done yet. But this is actually the first grant cohort um, where we've had a high number of STEM courses that applied for grants. Um, this is the first time I've worked with that many, and I actually am trying to get all of them together so that they can talk about what they're doing. And I'm trying to pull Don back into that conversation as well um, and kind of pulling on those resources that our instructional designers have talked about. Um, because they've done a lot of this work outside of humanities courses, um, and we're still kind of getting all of that information from them as well. Okay, so we have There's another oh, question. I, Any, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, I would say direct them to that open for anti-racism yeah. course, even if that's just a jumping off point, um, because it is free and open and anybody can go through it, I would say definitely refer them to that course. Um, we have faculty who come to us after the grants, uh, you know, have already been issued asking for help and asking for resources. And those are just kind of some of the things that we provide to them or just kind of those basic uh, resources that we give to the other faculty. Is there anything else you would add, Alexis? No, just whenever possible, I try to offer that extra set of hands, even if I, you know, can't really provide formal support, you know, if there's small things I can do, I try to do them. Um, connecting people to connecting. Connection is our huge part of what we do. Um, and so that's what I, I try to find valuable connections for people, even if it's, it's often not me, <laughs> but trying to find who it is.
And I'll check in on the Discord channel um, today and into next week if anyone has questions after the fact. Um, I put a link to our slides in there as well um, that I transferred over to a Google slide deck if anybody's interested in some of the links that we shared. Um, yeah, I can't think of anything else. Thank you so much for attending and for participating in our talk. Yes, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today, Amanda and Alexis. Um, a lot of information is on the Discord channel right now. There are some links, and like Amanda said, a link to this presentation is available and will remain available for um, for quite a while. I don't think there is a time limit on this. Uh, so feel free to contact our speakers and um, let us know if you have any questions. All right. Um, thank you again to our speakers today. I'm going to wrap us up um, since we're we're finished. So um, if if anybody was looking for um, our final session, unfortunately, it had to be canceled. So this is the end of OpenCon Ohio 2023. Um, did everybody have a good experience? Maybe